You're listening to Climate Champions, a podcast from the Architects Journal. I'm Hattie Hartman, Sustainability Editor at the Architects Journal. In this episode, we're continuing our focus on France with two guests who explore the uptake of biorenewable materials across the channel. And I'm Hattie's co-host, George Morgan, Director of 1.5 Architecture. We built with concrete since one century. And people considered concrete as the magical material. And this is the reason why I say that we should not think that there is one magic material. For me, this is the future. That's why I always tell to my students that they have to use the right quantity of the right material at the right place. And when I say the right materials, it can be naturally concrete or steel. Today, we continue our conversation with French architect, writer, and teacher Dominique gauzin muller Dominique is the curator of the exhibition Terra Fibre, on show in Paris at the Pavillon de l'Arsenal until February 27th. Our second guest is ACAN member and French structural engineer Frédéric Bougeron, who will share his insights on France's new embodied carbon regulations. Something similar needs to happen here in the UK. In our last episode, Dominique focused on different techniques for building with earth, in particular the latest innovations in using poured earth as an alternative to concrete. In this episode, we're talking about building with fiber, straw, hemp, bamboo, and thatch. Dominique explains why more than 6,000 buildings with straw have been built in France over the last decade and speculates on why French architects are taking up natural materials more rapidly than architects in the UK and starting to define a contemporary aesthetic with these traditional materials. Dominique, let's move on now and talk about fiber architecture. You've written a book about it that has many examples from around the world. It's not so surprising to see these materials being used creatively in Asia, Africa, and South America, but I was really surprised to learn that there are now more than 6,000 straw buildings in France, mostly built in the last decade. Why is building with biorenewable materials gaining such traction in France now? So 10 years ago in France, we only had about 450 buildings with straw insulation, or even built with straw bales, has load-bearing walls. And now we have more than 6,000. That's incredible. What has driven this change? There are a few reasons. Most of the earth buildings, or most of the regenerative material buildings in the UK are quite babacool. Baba cool, so hippie-ish, we might say. They have not a contemporary aesthetic. And mm-hmm. I think this is perhaps one of the reasons why they stayed in a small Bubble. corner. Yes. The work you're showing in the Terra Fibra Awards and in your books is more contemporary and design-led than much of what we're seeing here in the UK. Architects need to see this work to see what's possible. Very often, the base was done by pioneers. Pioneers. Exactly like for earth construction. For straw construction, Luc Floissac, who was architect and researcher at the architecture school in Toulouse. And he first wrote a book about uh, straw insulation, straw construction. And then he began to work on règles professionnelles, so professional rules. And at the same time, there were also a few architects and engineers who had the courage to try it 
in a new building, a big building. At the same time, around 2012, we built in France, in Mazan, an association building built out of wood with straw insulation with uh, engineer Olivier Gaujard, who was the engineer of most of the first uh, buildings with wood and straw. And at the same time, there was also the school with 6,000 straw bales near Paris in issy les moulineaux For this building, they asked for a fire test. And so they have tested a piece of the whole wall with a wood structure. And the straw insulation is mostly 37 centimeters thick because it is the thickness of the straw bales. So they tested a piece of the wall with the wood structure, 37 centimeter straw in between, inside a fermacell board and outside a void and then a wood cladding. And they made the test. It was very good because in the straw bales, the straw is so pressed that there is no oxygen and a fire needs oxygen to burn. After 90 minutes, there was only the first centimeter or the first two centimeters which had burnt and the rest was not touched. And because they had made this test open source, everybody who used the same construction could say there was already a test which was done and so we can use it also for our construction. Now there are about 25 buildings in Paris and around Paris which are built with wood construction and straw bales. Most of them with straw bale insulation, but a few of them with load bearing straw bales. And there is even a city near Paris, Rony sous Bois, uh, where since about 10 years now, they built all their buildings, especially school buildings or sport buildings or leisure buildings with uh, straw. What is really interesting is that the professional rules which allow to use straw bales in public buildings because the insurance can insure them and also the same year the fire test. And this opened really a lot of possibilities. There is a huge discussion about this here in the UK because of the Grenfell tragedy and subsequent inquiry. So the building regulations here in England were changed to ban any materials which count as combustible from external walls in many kind of buildings, even when these have been proved to perform very well in fire, like compressed straw. It's too simplistic a measure, I and mean, it's a problem for a shift towards these more sustainable materials. Yeah, what is also very important concerning the straw construction is that there is a very good network, the so-called Réseau Français de la Construction en Paille. They are very active and they are also now leaders on the European level. Now there is also a European network for straw construction. Among many things, this network helped for the publication of the Règle Professionnelle and they also organized many courses on different levels. One or two days for architects or architecture students just to give them an idea how it is possible to do it, but also for carpenters. And now there are more and more carpenters who are able to build a building out of wood and straw insulation. There are three main techniques to build out of straw. The first and oldest techniques is the load-bearing straw bales, where you put one straw bale on the other, like a stone wall. The second one is you make a structure out of wood, and on site you put the straw bales in between. 
And the third one, which is the most used, is that the carpenter prepared boxes out of wood panels and put the straw bales in it. And then they put it in front of the structure. Among the pioneers for straw construction, there was a social housing building with 26 apartments. It has two buildings, one with three levels and the other one with seven levels. It was built 2013, I think, in Les Vosges, so in saint dié des vosges The load-bearing part of the building is CLT, cross-laminated timber, about 15 centimeter thick. And on the outside, you have those boxes with 37 centimeter straw in wood panels. It shows that it is possible to build a seven levels with straw insulation. And in this case, this is also the team who allowed that. Because this is also what we defend, I told you before, by the frugality. We said we want to reduce everything what is material, the use of ground, of energy and material, but we want to increase the, the connection, the relationship between the actors of a project. And in this case, the housing firm, Le Trois Vosgien, decided already 2010, so 12 years ago, that they will only build with wood and straw. And the client, the architect, the engineer, wood engineer and uh, thermal engineer really worked together in such a, a positive way that they could achieve that in a quite normal budget. And uh, this firm, Le Trois Vosgien, also decided 2010 that all their building will be passive house standard, which makes sense in this region with a cold climate. It's great to be thinking about both the embodied impacts of the building materials as well as the operational impacts by using passive house to reduce those as well. That's great, yeah. Yeah, and there is also a social impact because this building, it has such an amazing technique which is quite robust because they also use the heat of the shower water to preheat, so it's really very cleverly done. When I visited it, I went to um, one of the apartments and the woman was very proud to show me that she pays only 15 to 20 euros per month for the energy, uh, for a very good comfort. We've had some very important passive house projects that have addressed fuel poverty here in the UK as well. Let me ask you about something else. The exhibition that's currently on in Paris shows about 40 projects, and they're pretty much evenly split between the Global North and Global South. In some parts of the Global South, the tradition of using biorenewable materials has been unbroken, and to some extent, that's true in France as well. But it's more difficult to grasp the transformation of the construction industry that's required to adapt supply chains in a country like France or here in the UK. What are your thoughts on that? I think that the big firms also know that they will soon have to pay a carbon tax, which is quite high and which will be higher and higher. So I think that they also try to, to find solutions. We have in France three of the biggest constructive firms in the world they also built now with wood, for instance. And they also participate to the big challenge of building always higher and higher with wood. And they do it in a, a quite industrial way. And there are also big firms who are trying to work with uh, hempcrete. But in hempcrete, you, you still have lime who needs a lot of grey energy. But you could also work with earth and other co-products of the agriculture, perhaps sunflowers, 
because by the sunflowers you take only the seeds to make the oil but you could use the rest we have to be very creative in the use of all the co-products of the agriculture and even the co-products of the industry we are pioneer for earth construction because france is the country in europe where all the old techniques were used depending on where you were so between Grenoble and Lyon and also around Clermont-Ferrand, they were using warmed earth. And it's even in this region that concrete was created and they used the formwork of uh, warmed earth for the first concrete, cement concrete buildings, which is amazing, I think. And they used it because the ground had just a good formulation for that. This is something which is also very important, and I should perhaps have begun with that. Depending on the types of grains that you have in the earth, you can make different techniques. And so when you are on a site and you have an earth, you can adapt your earth to the technique you want to do. If you want to do round earth, and if you have not big grains, then you have to put a few stones. Perhaps uh, if you want to use another technique, sand is missing or clay is missing and you have to uh, put it to make the better formulation. And the other solution is that you adapt the technique to the earth what you have. And this is what they have done during millenniums. And this is the reason why you have warmed earth around Lyon. In Lyon, you still have buildings which are seven levels high, built two centuries ago by the Renaissance, inspired by Quintero. More than 200 buildings in Lyon. And uh, there are also many around uh, Clermont-Ferrand. But in Toulouse, they had more clay and less stones. So they have made bricks, so adobe. And in the region where they had a little bit wood, clay and fibers like straw, then they have made wattle and daub. And you find wattle and daub in Alsace, but also in Normandy, around Paris and in Bourgogne and also in Lelande. We have to look at the way the people in the tradition have built to know for what the earth that we have on our site is good. And the technique, which is very common in your country, in the UK, and also a little bit in Normandy and in, um, in Bretagne, is cob. And also cob with cob walls and with straw, so wheat, patch. And I think that the creativity is now to have a look at what was done in the vernacular architecture and to adapt it with new techniques. For instance, in the FIBRA award, among the finalists, we had an office building in Nantes, in the middle of the middle city. And uh, the cladding was made out of wheat. But in this case, they had made a machine to make prefabricated wood panels. So we really have to adapt uh, to the techniques. And it's also what they do when they go for the CEB, when they go from a one-person machine to a bigger machine, which is able to produce perhaps 10,000 CEB a day. So that was the reason why we have in France this second renaissance of earth construction. Concerning straw, it's very easy. We always say we are... Le grenier à blé de l'Europe, the wheat granary of Europe. Because we have, uh, we grow a lot of wheat, we have straw as co-products. There are even people who burn the straw, which is really uh, very negative because by burning you create CO2. And so it's quite normal that we try to use it. We also have rice in south of France, in the Camargue, and now there are people trying to develop the use of rice straw in the construction. Also because before, 
people used to burn the wise straw. And even we, we tried to find a use for lavender straw. Because in south of France, so around Marseille, we have also a lot of lavender. And concerning hemp, we, we are the first hemp producer in Europe. We used to use it for clothes and also for robes. And now we, we use it also for hempcrete. The professional rules for hemp construction were also published in 2012. And it helped to make a few pilot projects, like refurbishing of social housing in Paris, and also even new buildings in Paris and around Paris. Among the winners of the Terra Fibra Award, we have a, a building with seven stories out of hempcrete. So hempcrete is not load bearing, so you need a wood construction, but it is quite good for the insulation. And uh, a few social housing firms in Paris and around Paris uses now hempcrete. Why do they use it, especially in Paris? It is because, you know, Paris is built on a kind of Swiss cheese with a lot of holes. Because they took the calc stones to build the buildings in the middle of the city. And then when Paris extended, it was built on the former quarries. The former quarries. And, and then if you want to build, you have to search for the good ground quite deep. And this is very expensive. But hempcrete is quite light. And that's why if you build with hempcrete, with wood and hempcrete, and you don't have to make those expensive special foundations. And this is why regenerative materials becomes less expensive than a building in concrete. Fantastic. So you've talked about cost and fire and insurance. What are the other barriers for the more widespread use of biorenewable materials? With straw, there seems to be quite a lot of availability. Are there problems with warranties or people worrying about things that will go wrong? One of the problems for the massification of those materials in France is cultural. We built with concrete since one century and uh, people considered concrete as the magical material. And all our industry is based on concrete. And it's difficult for architects who learned how to build in concrete and steel, who already built thousands and thousands of square meters in concrete, to accept that it was not perhaps as wonderful as they thought. And this is what makes also difficult to teach those materials in most of the architecture schools, because most of the architects who teach there, they have built that. And so many of them have not first the courage to say that there's something else than concrete and steel. And they don't take the time to learn, to get the competences concerning these materials. That's also a problem. I think it changes now, especially in the school of Nancy. We had one of the pioneers for wood construction, Jean-Claude Bignon. He worked also with the director of the wood engineer school in Epinal, and they created a, a special master for wood construction. And they created it about 15 years ago. And every year they have 25 architects or engineers have half and they teach them how to work together, how to build with those materials. This is one of the reasons why Grand Test is so rich in inspiring examples of frugal architecture and a really wonderful project. We're going to have to go have a look, George, if we ever emerge from this pandemic. Yeah, really, it's really wonderful. But I, I really want to say clearly here that I, I don't throw um, 
uh, we say jeter la pierre in French. I don't know if you have the same. Oh, to cast a stone. Yeah, so uh, to, the, to the architects of the 50s or to the modern architects, they had very big problems at that time with the knowledges and the competencies that they had. Concrete really appeared as a magic material and they had to build millions of uh, housing very quickly and with very few budget. And they couldn't imagine that what they have done at that time would be a problem for us. And I think we have to be also very modest and to try to make choices that will not badly influence the next generation. And this is the reason why I say that we should not think that there is one magic material. And this is also the reason why after the Terra Award, I propose to do the Fibra Award because you cannot solve the problems with only earth construction. You have to use other products, other materials. And I think that the combination between the mass of earth and the insulation capacity of the straw and so on is really a very good combination. This is the future. That's why I always tell to my students that they have to use the right quantity of the right material at the right place. And when I say the right materials, it can be naturally concrete or steel. Because if you use steel in a wood structure, it can help you to reduce the thickness of the wood. The depth, yes, hybrid structures. Yeah, and I also know that we will still need concrete for the foundation. Because naturally, you can also make wood foundation, but, but the wood, we need it for something else. So we have to use each material where it has the most competence. Dominique, I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you in a more personal way, how did you get interested in this approach to architecture and this way of building? When I studied architecture, I had the luck to be in the atelier of Roland Schweitzer, one of the pioneers for wood construction. And he was also a very big specialist for vernacular architecture. I still remember how enthusiastic he was when he came back from one of his many trips, especially in Japan. He was a very big specialist for old Japan architecture or in Scandinavia. And he came in the atelier and then he couldn't wait till he shows us the pictures of the buildings old and new that he had discovered. And I think my enthusiasm to share with other people what I find inspiring comes, among others, from him. He invited many specialists from all over the world, engineers, architects, and also people from the forest and, and so on. So it was really an holistic approach of wood construction. Pierre Lajus, he was the other pioneer for wood construction. He was the creator of the so-called École d'Architecture de Bordeaux, and he built a, around 1,000 wood houses around Bordeaux. He worked with a, a carpenter and he designed a few prototypes which were repeated about 1,000 times. And for me, he is also one of the pioneers of the frugal architecture because he shows also that we have to work with the already there and to change it and to be creative with what we have. Okay. So, last question. What will you be working on in the next few months? I have a wonderful project. I think we will finish it in 2022. And it's a book about the work of my very good friend and wonderful architect, Anna Heringer. The time is right now for Anna. We spoke to Anna Heringer on episode six. Perhaps her time has finally come. Yes, the time is, is right to finish it. And uh, the base of this book is an exchange that Anna and I had over many, many months. And it's 
amazing how inspiring this young woman is. And she is so authentic. The force of this book will be that she also say what was wrong and what she has done. She was very frightened sometimes and that it was very difficult. And, and I think that a lot of young architects and also a lot of students can recognize what they feel in what she says and writes. And I think it can give them courage to go their own way, also if it brings them very often over their comfort zone. Then I am preparing a book about earth construction with uh, one of my former students, the one I spoke about before, who built five or six buildings, two with poured earth and the others with uh, rammed earth. I'd love to see these books available in English. And then I'm preparing Architecture Frugale, 20 examples inspirant dans le Grand Est, so Frugal Architecture, 20 inspiring examples in Grand Est. I'm preparing the same for the region Auvergne uh, Rhone Alpes, so the region around Clermont Ferrand and around Lyon. And tomorrow I will have also a discussion with the leader of the local frugality group in uh, Lille. And she also wants to make one for that area. And so this is a collection that we now begin. And we do it in a way that it costs only 10 euros. And then what about your dissertation? I changed a little bit. I will work on 10 to 15 built projects to analyze why it worked when there were breaks in the chain and how they went over these breaks to realize it. We also have to change the way you choose the firms. The procurement process, yes, the way you choose the contractor. Yeah, because those materials like earth and, uh, and so on, the specialists for that are mostly small craftsmen and small firms. So we, we should give more power to the small firms, because if you give them more power, there will be also more people who make these kind of firms. There are more and more young architects now who are deciding to go away from the computer and who decide to make design build. Timur Ersen, for example, a French Turk architect, worked a few years by Martin Rauch, and then he, he created his firm for Rammed Earth in uh, La Drôme, not far away from Lyon. And now he builds has a craftsman, and uh, there are more and more young architects who tell me, I want to build, I want to use my hands. And I think it is very positive because they know how to achieve the details that they want to have at the end. The way of choosing the firms, the contractors, help those people to have more, more power. Fantastic, Dominique. This has been such an interesting discussion. We'll capture these many projects and practices that you've mentioned in the show notes for this episode. Thank you very, very much, Dominique. We'll, be, we'll stay in touch. You're welcome. It was very pleasant. I'm delighted because we can share your work with our audience now. And I think the time is right because people are interested in these topics now. Five years ago, they were not interested. And things are changing. There's a lot of focus on embodied carbon now. Our next guest is ACAN member, structural engineer, Frédéric Bourgeron, who is based in Rennes in Brittany in France. Together with ACAN coordinator, Joe Giddings, Frédéric wrote an excellent ACAN blog on the new building regulations in France, which are updated every three years and which are driving change. We'll put a link in the show notes. With all the pressure for adoption of Part Z on embodied carbon into the building regulations, 
and MP Duncan Baker's introduction of a carbon emissions buildings bill into parliament this week. I thought it would be timely to hear more about what is going on in France. So Frédéric, can you introduce yourself and tell us who you are? Sure, thank you, Hattie. So I'm Frédéric Bourgeon. I'm a structural engineer by trade. I've been working for about 10 years in different practices, coming from civil engineering at first and switched to buildings more recently. And I was tasked switching jobs to develop a timber uh, initiative. And that's where I got uh, interested in natural materials. It was first timber and then straw building, then earth building and so on. And I keep discovering and pushing through doors and having a lot of fun on the way. Fantastic. How did you get involved in ACAN? I went looking for like-minded people, first in France, and heard about Frugalité Heureuse and Creative, of course. But then I was looking for something more, getting more involved with politics and really getting into the details. And that's when I found and heard about ACAN. So tell us about the French regulations regarding biorenewable materials. Explain to us how there could be so many straw buildings built in France over the last decade. There's a host of regulations in France pushing for bio-based materials in construction, especially, and straw is a really pioneering technique. Straw building is not new. It's been there for more than 100 years. Around 2010, slightly before, builders, architects, engineers got curious about what happened in, in Canada where uh, a community in Quebec started self-building with straw. So they they heard about that and they brought some of these techniques back to France where the resource for straw is really large. I mean, the capacity for building is, is really large. And there was no structure. There was no framework or um, regulation, any standard for that that didn't deter them from building anyway. And so building after building, they gained a lot of experience and they figured that that experience had to be shared in some way out of these groups of people that knew each other. And uh, they wrote what we call a règle professionnelle, which is midway from shared knowledge that can happen on site every day and the standard that is very precise words very precise sentences everything is tested everything is under control like a and british standard exactly it provides a certain framework so that a certain quality is maintained and people can get their insurance so that's what we have had for about 10 years and I think that explains a lot about the, the, the increase and the number of uh, straw buildings that we have in France. And what about this RE2020? Yeah, so RE2020 is Règlement Environnemental. And basically in, in France, since the 70s, we've had thermal regulations that uh, have raised the bar progressively on the insulation. And it's been maybe six or seven years in the making now, but we've come in France to such a point that insulation has, has become better and better. And now embodied carbon is the main point of progress that we can see forward. So RE 2020 had the embodied carbon to the uh, thermal performance of the buildings and it's a whole new regulation that's applicable just now, like 1st of January 2022. It was delayed a bit. That's why it's called 2020, but it's applicable only just now. Is that also going to drive lower embodied carbon materials? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. at first it was optional to care about embodied carbon. And now it's the regulation. You have to run LCA analysis 
you have to show the numbers before you, you actually build. And this regulation is structured so that there are several steps of progressing so that the industry has time to catch up, so that the teams, the builders have time to learn about the new techniques or the new materials that can answer to the new requirements. So how long does it take for the industry to catch up? Are we talking two years, three years, five years? The schedule that the government has decided is a three-year schedule. So from now, 2022, next step up would be 2025, then 2028 and 2031. So at the moment, it's really the baseline of the regulation. In 2025, it will be a bit yeah. more demanding, but at 2028, everyone is quite nervous about the requirements. It's really pushing forward the industry. So let me just be sure I understand this. So you're saying that this proliferation in straw buildings over the last decade has been driven by some pioneers and then the adoption of these règles professionnelles, these professional kind of guidance? Yeah, I, I think so. The fact that the regulation, the framework exists, that you can get insurance, it makes the technique more uh, visible for the professionals. It just creates a dynamic for these straw buildings to get more and more uh, numerous year after year. Well, it seems like things are moving in France. We still are playing catch up here in the UK and we don't hear much about what's going on in France. That's why I was keen to talk to you because I think we need to understand what's working well elsewhere and how to jumpstart this whole process to make it all happen more quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clearly. It's, it's all a sharing of knowledge and it's always a pleasure to, to share what's working and try and replicate that somewhere else. Great. Thank you very much, Fabi. If you're enjoying Climate Champions, please rate us and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. It helps people find us so we can build an audience. You can find the show notes for this and previous episodes at architectsjournal.co.uk forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.